Hey everyone, welcome back to Power Electronics. Today we're still talking about the flatback. So let's get right into it. Last time we kind of talked about, well we ended the lecture mentioning that weird stuff happens if you start including the leakage inductance, right? You know, we, we found, basically we found the, the DC solution for the converter operating in CCM and DCM, and we found that the flyback looks a lot like a buck boost, right? In fact, it's derived from a, from a buck boost. Or you can derive it from a buck boost. And it's true, this is true, maybe there is also isolation involved, right? You get isolation for free. Or at least you don't need an extra element to get isolation because the flyback transformer is both a transformer and an inductor. However, it's a little bit more than that, right? There's a, there's a little, little bit more going on. And one thing to consider is uh, the switch stress or the, vol uh, the voltage and currents. Right now we're just going to look at voltage that the switches are exposed to. Specifically, let's look at the FET. So, we have the flyback. We have our magnetizing inductance with the primary winding. And we have our, our MOSFET, right? And here I'm actually going to include both the body diode, which is always there for power FETs, and the output capacitance, which we might call Let's call it COSS, because that's how it's labeled in the data sheet. And source, drain, all that fun stuff. And this is connected to the secondary side, where we have a diode and the output. Right, and this diode, as you remember, turning it on and off, is it's an electronic device, meaning we use elect electrons to control the state of the device itself. And the way you do that is basically by charging or injecting charge or removing charge from the junction, right? And another way of thinking about that is thinking about the capacitance of the diode, right? So there is some kind of inherent capacitance with this diode. And we also have the turns ratio at 1 to n, and the dots are on opposite sides, right? So Vg. And we've gone over this before. Right now I'm just including the magnetizing inductance. We have the output cap. We have the diode, and we have Q, right? And we, we already solved this converter, and I just want to, we're going to be looking basically at DCM, the waveforms in DCM, because the waveforms of CCM are actually kind of a subset of the waveforms for DCM, especially for the voltage across the FET Q. So, if we look at this voltage, let's just call this uh, VQ. If we look at this voltage over the switching cycle, we'll see three distinct sub-intervals, right? So maybe we'll call this D1TS, and then we have D1 plus D2TS, and then finally TS. So this length of time is D1TS, this length of time is D2TS, and then this is D3, but we don't really care about that. So what happens? Well, looking at VQ, or not VG, looking at VQ, in the first sub-interval, the switch is on, and ideally we think of that as the switch being, or having zero volts across it, right? There is some voltage because there's some on resistance, but here we simplify and just say that there's zero volts across it. When the switch goes off, eventually the diode turns on, and what we see is a reflected voltage minus, or really, because I've drawn it in this trick, it's V out over N, right? V out over N here, VG here, so if you go around this loop, we see when things have stabilized, the voltage across the FET should be, should go up to VG plus V out over N, right? And then the third sub-interval, if we're considering DCM, right, this is like the DCM interval, in this third sub-interval, well, both devices are off, right? So this is off, and this is off. 
no current flows through this, so we can assume that the voltage across the magnetizing inductance is zero, let's say, or at least the average voltage across the magnetizing inductance is zero because it's not increasing or decreasing, meaning the voltage across the FET should simply be VG, right? Because this, the voltage, the average voltage across this is zero. The only other element is a switch, so we have VG. So the kind of first order DC solution looks something like this. VG plus VO over N down to VG, and then the cycle continues. Again, this is DCM. And this is just the, we can call this, say, the DC solution to the FET voltage. However, this isn't all that go is going on. And there, basically, if you include leakage inductance, this looks completely different. And to understand what's going on, we're going to include leakage, and then we're going to actually kind of divide this out to see exactly how transitions happen in this, in this converter, right? What happens when you turn off the FET? So what I want to do is to, to show kind of the trade-off and maybe some solutions you need to, to solve it with this is to analyze the flyback with leakage inductance. Right, the other non-ideality of our flyback transformer. All right, so what does this look like? Well, the flyback converter looks as follows. Now we include a leakage inductance, which I draw here. We have the magnetizing inductance, the primary winding, right? Again, this is just a model, right? This The whole flyback transformer is really just a two winding device. All the, the magnetizing inductance and leakage inductance are representations of non-idealities. This is connected to a MOSFET, which has some output capacitance, and this is important. This is COSS. And then we connect to the secondary side, right? Through the transformer. So we have, again, the diode. And again, this diode has some capacitance, intrinsic capacitance, because that's how we change the state of the diode. Right? A very small change has happened, but it has actually really big implica implications on how this converter operates. So let's start again. So first, in the first time interval, which we can say is zero to D1TS. Again, I'm going to consider DCM because the waveforms for DCM include the waveform for the voltage across the FET in CCM, but there's some extra stuff happens, that's, which is also interesting. So in the first sub-interval, the converter looks pretty similar, right? How we expect it to look, right? This is on. Or I should actually label some stuff, right? This is L leakage. This is LM. This is Q. This is D. COSS. I'll call this CD. This is CO. We have the output voltage over here. The normal stuff, right? All right. So in the first sub interval, right, which is same as before, again, the magnetizing, the leakage is included, primary winding, and this FET is on. And you can include some resistance here, I won't for now. Maybe I'll just include a little dotted resistance. It exists, but we're not actually going to consider it for this particular case. And then the diode is off, right? It's open. And we can also imagine that there is a cap here, right? Okay. So. What's going on here? Right? Well, we have the leakage inductance. Right? We have LM. We have CD. We have CO. So here, in this first sub-interval, we actually have a series connection. Of the leakage inductance and the magnetizing inductance. LM, right? This means that they share the same current. 
right? It's basically it's basically just acting as one inductor, and there's only one current flowing in this loop, right? No current flows here through the primary winding because the diode is off, and the diode is off because the junction capacitance is reverse bias, or it's it's charged up to some voltage, right? Right. We could say that the voltage across the diode is actually, well, we're applying bait roughly, again, because L leakage is here, it's a little bit less, but for approximation purposes, you could say there's approximately VG across here, right? There's approximately VG across here, which means that there is plus minus NVG on the secondary side, right, it's reflected over to the secondary side because we haven't saturated the core yet, which means the voltage across the diode, the diode is reverse biased, with a voltage of NVG plus V out. <clears throat> right, so this cap is actually charged up. So what happens when we turn off the switch? So let, let's let's indicate the next subinterval. So, sorry, D1, TS, T, up to say some time, I'll just call it T2. So this is when we turn off the switch, Q. So, in the instant after we turn off the switch, I mean, there's all these elements, right? Voltages and currents don't change instantaneously because we have inductances and capacitances. So in this moment, we've turned off the switch, right? So we could say it's off, but there is still a body diode. And there's still a capacitance. And what's more, this capacitance is at zero volts at this instant, right? Right when we turn off the switch, th that cap hasn't charged up yet. What's more, the diode hasn't turned on yet, right? Because this capacitance still has the voltage, voltage it did before, right? We still have some cap, some junction capacitance, which, which we have to inject some charge into to turn on the diode, right? So this CD, this is C out, this CD is still at NVG plus V out. Right, and this leakage inductance still has the same current that it did just before, right? So maybe let's go over here and I'll, I'll draw some waveforms. So what do we have? Well, we know that the, uh, the magnetizing current so far, we've gone up to say, say this is the, uh, this is TS. We've gone up to D1 TS so far. We've charged up the magnetizing inductance, right? And in this moment, the leakage inductance is the same as the magnetizing inductance. So we'll just draw that kind of over top, right? In this moment, the leakage inductance is the magnetizing inductance, right? Up until this point. And this is some current I peak, which happens to be VG D1 TS over LM plus L leakage, right? That's the peak current. That's the current we're at at this moment. Now we're looking at the interval, the, a very short interval between D1 TS and this time T1. Maybe what we also want to look at is the voltage across the FET. So this is VQ. So up until now, it's been basically zero. And at this very moment, right at right at T1, D1 TS, just before T1, the voltage across the FET is still zero because the cap hasn't charged up yet. In this interval, this sub-interval, from D1 TS to T1, we are charging up both this output cap, COSS, and this this uh, diode cap, basically. We're changing the state of this diode to turn on the diode. 
So in this subinterval, the current established in LM can flow in both ways, right? Basically have two current loops. We have the current loop through here and the current loop through here, right? So some current is able to flow through the primary winding into the secondary winding. So it's flowing out of the dot here, which means it should be flowing into the dot. So we have current flowing in this direction. Now the output capacitance should be much larger than the diode capacitance, or we could consider this as basically a constant voltage, which is what we normally do, right? This is like small ripple approximation, V out. So basically we have something like, the secondary side looks something like at this moment, a cap connected to a voltage source, right? V out. Which means we can kind of simplify this circuit, right? So we have a cap here. We have a leakage inductance. I'm just going to redraw this. So we have our input voltage, Vg, which is connected to our leakage inductance, our magnetizing inductance. And I'm going to reflect this over to the primary side. So we have some capacitance and we have some voltage, right? And their polarities are flipped. All right, so I've just reflected it through the winding. Let's not worry about the exact values right now. But basically, we have this kind of situation. This is LM, right? So we have current flowing through this loop and current flowing through this loop. Now remember, initially, this voltage was at NVG plus V out. When we reflect that voltage over, we get VG plus V out over N right across this and the direction should be opposite to the output voltage right and you can see that this current actually what it does is discharge this capacitor right it kind of removes charge from it eventually so we have coss Right, and this effective capacitance, which is like something, it's related to CD and the turns ratio, let's say n squared CD. For this moment in time, we're changing the voltages of these two capacitors, right? Both switches are kind of off in a sense. The diode hasn't turned off yet or turned on yet. And the, the, uh, the MOSFET is still kind of turning is still kind of turning off. Its current is still kind of flowing through it to charge up the, that capacitance. So, I mean, we can kind of consider for this very short interval, this inductance acts like a current source, right? It's just these capacitances are so small relative to this inductance that there's more than enough energy to change the state of these caps. So let's just write that out. LM stores enough energy to change the voltages of COSS and CD without changing ILM, or say IPEAK, very much, right? So the change in IPEAK is very small in this short interval. So in this short interval, the magnetizing inductance stays roughly constant, we could say. And because the leakage inductance is in series with it, it must share the same current. So it stays relatively constant at I peak. And the MOSFET voltage is charged up, right? And you could say that the, uh, the diode voltage also changes. So it's charging up, up until what point? Right, so we're, we're charging up, we're injecting charge into this capacitor. When does it change? When, when, does this, when does this state end? When does the diode turn on? Well, it turns on, so this, this starts at zero volts and this is at Vg plus V out over N. Well, if you think about with a steady state, right, after a long period of time, this output capacitor is going to go up to Vg plus V out over N. And as a result, this, this voltage is going to go towards zero. So we're kind of like changing the voltages in opposite directions of these, of these two capacitors. So this is going towards Vg plus V out over N. 
right? And when it hits that point, the diode turns on. So when we get, when we fully discharge this, and you could also include VF, but it's, VF is so small, the forward voltage drop is so, so small relative to this voltage that it shouldn't matter that much. So, when the diode voltage goes to zero, really the forward voltage drop, it turns on, right? And then we have a state change, right? The circuit itself changes because we have a discontinuity in the properties of the device, right? The device starts conducting after this point. The diode turns on. There's some nonlinearity going on. So we have a new interval, right? We have an interval T1 up to T2. So what is going on in this interval? Well, some interesting stuff. So now we still have the leakage inductance, but now our magnetizing inductance is kind of connected to the to the secondary side, right? This is kind of how we described it before. We've fully turned on this diode, so the diode is conducting. And the MOSFET is still off, but there's still a capacitance. And I'm just going to draw the, the body diode and the capacitor. So one way of imagining this, right, this is... L leakage, this is VG, this is COSS. So one way of imagining this is that this output voltage is reflected to the primary side and we can imagine that there is a voltage source V out over N over here, right? And this kind of completely takes LM out of the circuit. So because AC wise, voltage sources look like shorts, Basically, the fact that this voltage source is reflected to the primary side means that the magnetizing inductance is effectively bypassed in the circuit. So we no longer, current current can flow through this loop, but it doesn't th flow through the magnetizing inductance. It actually flows through the secondary one, you could say, right? So we still have this leakage inductance current, right? This leakage inductance current is not flowing in the same path as a magnetizing inductance. Now this magnetizing inductance is part of the secondary side, you could say, but this leakage is still pr part of the primary side. There's still energy stored in that leakage inductance. So what happens with that? Well, if we redraw this, we can redraw this in the following way. This has basically been eliminated, right? The, leakage, the magnetizing inductance has basically been eliminated, resulting in some leakage inductance, with some effective uh, output voltage, we could say, followed by a cap, right? This is V out over N, this is VG, and this is COSS. And if you want to simplify it further, we could just draw it like this, combining the two voltage sources. And this is VG plus V out over N. So what's this? This is a harmonic oscillator. right? We have some energy stored here, right? We have some I peak still here, right? We've just changed states, but the current through the leakage inductance hasn't changed instantaneously. We've stored some energy there. This, we also have energy stored in here, right? This is, the voltage at this point is uh, VG plus V out over N, right? So this thing begins to oscillate. The voltage across, across VQ and the current through the leakage inductance, I leak, right? These two state variables begin to oscillate, right? We have an oscillator, which means that we actually get a voltage spike in the voltage across the MOSFET, right? The energy stored in this leakage inductance continues to flow and it continues to flow into this, into this, uh, FET output capacitor, right? Which means that the voltage will rise up and eventually it'll reach a point where it's so high that the voltage in the leakage inductance will reverse and vice versa. It'll go back and forth. So we have an oscillator. This causes a voltage spike. On the FET, right? How big? How big is this spike? 
well, you can do differential equations and stuff to figure it out, but the way I, uh, the easy way for me to think about it anyways is to think about, well, we know that the voltage at this point has reached Vg plus V out over N, but this current is still flowing in this direction, meaning we're going to charge up the up output capacitor, or the COSS. The extra voltage that we see across that uh, COSS is related to the energy stored in this inductor. Assuming that all this energy gets dumped into the capacitor before there's a uh, reversal in current, maybe it's not the best assumption, but if it's completely undamped, then maybe that, that is the case. Then we can say that the energy stored in the leakage, which is equal to half L leakage, I peak squared, goes into this capacitor, right? So there's already some energy in the capacitor, right? Half Vg plus V over N all squared times COSS. But we're going to get an, an additional voltage bump. So maybe I'll say uh, the energy in the, uh, in the oscillation, in the voltage oscillation, is going to be equal to half COSS, and then maybe let's say the, the delta V squared. The, ch the extra change in voltage. Again, this is just kind of a, a hand wavy kind of thing, but we can figure out the extra voltage, the, the peak voltage that we see on top of this. So if we equate these two things, right, if all this energy goes into the capacitor, then what do we get? Well, the halves will cancel out. And then what we see is that delta V squared is going to be equal to I peak squared times L leakage over COSS, right? And then if we take the square root, then we get something like delta V is equal to I peak times the root of L leakage over COSS, which is like the characteristic impedance of this resonant network. It's kind of like, you know, Z, the characteristic Z or whatever. It's an undamped system. So depending on the peak current, right, which is equal to D1, D, Ts times Vg over Lm plus L leakage times root L leakage over COSS, right? This will change how big the voltage spike is, right? So basically, the higher the peak current, the bigger the voltage spike on, on the FET is going to be. So what does this mean? Why is this important? Well, consider designing a switch or choosing a switch for this application. What do you see? When you when you start when you turn the switch off, you get this huge voltage spike, right? And it starts oscillating. And we'll say it's uh, it oscillates like this. There's some frequency, right? We we can we can also consider the frequency. Right? The frequency is related to the omega is 1 over 2 uh, 1 over root L leakage times COSS, right? This is like the conventional resonant frequency of an oscillator. You think about F 2 pi f naught is equal to omega naught. And this peak, this delta v, the delta v is equal to i peak times root L leakage over COSS. Right, so if this is really big, then you have to choose a transistor with a higher blocking voltage, right? This spike. can and will destroy a FET. If you build a flyback and you don't consider this oscillation, this uh, resonance when you turn off the switch, when you're designing what FET to choose, that FET will most likely explode, right? Say you choose a 100-volt FET and there is a 50-volt oscillation on it, right? It's very undamped. That FET is going to blow, right? So you have to think about this oscillation when you're designing the FET. Okay, so this, this thing is going to oscillate for some period of time, right? It'll eventually die out, right? This oscillation will eventually die out. But when do we go into our third state? Well, we go into the third state when DCM occurs, right? When the, leakage, when the magnetizing inductance goes to, uh, current goes to zero.
So eventually we get into the third state. And what happens in the third state? Well, and we could say this is like d1 plus d2 ts up to the end of the switching cycle. Well, again, we have our, magnet our leakage, we have our magnetizing. The primary side is now disconnected from the secondary side, right? This diode is now off again. We can imagine that there's a cap here, right? Or it's just off, whatever you want to say. And this is, the Q is still off, right? It's still just a diode, a body diode, and the output cap. However, if this is open, right, we can consider this an open circuit because this is an open circuit. If this is open, then this primary side still looks like an like uh, looks like an oscillator. Except now we've included the leakage inductance in that oscillator. So now we have a new oscillator with the leakage, the magnetizing, and the output cap, right? COSS, or the output of the of the of the MOSFET, LM, L leak, and VG. Again, this is an oscillator, right? Except now we have a new inductance, which means we're going to oscillate again, but at a much lower frequency. So let's say omega naught prime is going to be equal to one over root L leak plus LM COSS right? And there's going to be some energy stored, right? There's some energy stored in this COSS. So that's going to oscillate, right? The energy stored in here is going to oscillate. And we can, you could figure out the peak. It's not that big an issue because it's always going to be less than the peak associated with when you turn the switch off, right? So we have this new circuit with a new oscillation frequency. which occurs for this last subinterval, And we know that the average is going to be V out and it's going to oscillate in the following way, right? Right, so this is a new omega naught. This is omega naught prime, right? So the voltage across the FET is actually totally different than the buck boost, right? It has all this crazy stuff because we have this leakage inductance and we have all this cr crazy state changing stuff. So let's just redraw this in a nicer way to see everything that's going on. So we have a multi-state system, right? It's not just turning the switch off and everything changes instantly. Things take time to change and as a result, it gets complicated. So, I'm gonna draw ILM. Here, let's, let's, let's do nice colors. So we're gonna have ILM. We're gonna have I leakage. This is the end of the swishing cycle. We have zero up to D1TS. And we have some small subintervals, which I'll make larger to exaggerate the point. And we have our third subinterval. So I'll just call this D1 plus D2, TS. And over here, this is like T1. And we're gonna draw VQ. So in the beginning, again, we're assuming DCM. So ILM is charged up to some peak current. The leakage inductance is in series and thus the currents are the same for this interval. And the FET voltage is zero effectively. Again, on resistance, current flowing through it, it's gonna be non-zero nonetheless. We turn off the switch the voltage across the switch is still zero at that instant, and it takes time to charge up. The current through the leakage inductance and the magnetizing inductance stays roughly constant because the output capacitance of the switch is much smaller than the energy stored. 
or the energy required to change the voltage state of the switch is much smaller than the energy stored in the magnetizing inductance and leakage. Thus, the current stays approximately the same for this period of time. And this voltage rises up. It rises up to, again, it's basically, this looks like a current source to this cap. It charges up until Vg plus V out over N. At that point, the diode on the secondary side turns on, changing the state of the circuit, right? It removes the, the magnetizing inductance from the primary side, basically brings it over to the secondary side, but the leakage inductance is still in a circuit with this output capacitance of the switch, right? So the leakage inductance is somewhere here. At this point, the leakage inductance and the output capacitance start oscillating. And the energy in sort of the leakage inductance is transferred to the output cap and vice versa. So we've seen that the voltage across the output cap of the switch starts oscillating, right? With a frequency omega naught. We'll call it omega naught. Simultaneously, the current in the leakage inductance also starts oscillating, right? Starts oscillating, going like crazy, while the, the magnetizing inductance is discharging and eventually reaching zero. So again, this is also oscillating with omega naught. When the magnetizing inductance reaches zero, we enter the DCM state, so-called DCM state. Both switches are off. At this point, the magnetizing inductance is reintroduced to the primary side and begins to oscillate with the leakage inductance and the output capacitance of the switch. As a result, the voltage starts oscillating. The average of the voltage across the switch is simply VG. And the switch starts oscillating with a new frequency omega naught prime, right? And this can, this can be extremely undamped, right? So it may, it may not decay very much at all, but we have a new omega naught, omega naught prime. And the current in the leakage and the magnetizing, again, align because they're in series. And they both oscillate with this same omega naught, right? So this, we can assume that it follows or is phase shifted from this voltage. I'm not drawing it exactly well, but nonetheless, it's phase shifted from the voltage with a frequency of omega naught prime. So in this first subinterval, or th this, this interval here, Okay, so we can say in this interval, COSS charged with constant current, we could say, from LM. In this interval, the leakage inductance and COSS oscillate. And then in this third subinterval, L leak, LM, and COSS oscillate. And then the cycle begins again, right? Then it just starts all over again. Now you'd hope that you'd switch to switch on when this is at a minimum. There's a lot of stuff you can do with that. But nonetheless, this is approximately what's going on. So we have omega naught, which is equal to one over two, uh, one over root, sorry. L leakage COSS, and then here omega naught prime is equal to one over root L leak plus LM COSS. And this, this peak is something you should know. So this delta V, delta V must be accounted for. Otherwise, stuff explodes. And there are kind of two main ways of dealing with this. One way is you choose a huge switch. Question mark. One. Use a big switch. 
All right, that's one solution. You can just use a switch that is rated for a very high voltage. Unfortunately, that results in basically slower, slower switch, right? More switching loss, you could say. And maybe the higher on resistance. Maybe. The other option is to use something called a snubber. And there's a few different snubbers. There's active and passive snubbers. We're going to look at, sorry, we're going to design an RCD sub snubber next lecture. And this allows you to reduce that peak voltage, right? Or limit the peak voltage across the switch. And that's what we're going to get into next lecture. I think this is already long enough. Thanks. Uh, I'll see you next time.